Greetings, this is Terra Illumination. I felt obliged to put this up uh, Sunday early afternoon over here. And something that I felt I needed to share. Uh, by the way, if you're watching this, please take this as a sort of a reminder. Oh, Sunday night, I have uh, three readings backed up already. One for Fluffles, if she shows up. One for uh, Esther, if she shows up. And one for Gregory, if he shows up. I'm still really kind of flimsy these days, uh, for whatever reason. Uh, I'm still fully conscious, as you can tell, but I, I feel like I've gone through a tremendous amount recently. Some of that I want to share right now, okay? So just bear with me. Okay, so I was up early. And I went off to my usual thing where I stroll over to McDonald's and have a cup of coffee. And it's very therapeutic for me. And there's air conditioning, so it keeps me out of the intense heat. Uh, by the time I actually get dressed and cleaned up and head out, um, it's already so hot, it's just debilitating. So psychologically, I just, you know, okay, no big deal, just deal with it going from extreme heat to, uh, you know, commercial grade air conditioning, which is about, I don't know, I think about 77, where in the most places, in these commercial places like McDonald's and casinos and uh, the library and so on. So it helps me to operate cool. I remember when I lived in England, uh, it's, I mean, right, it's, it's summer, so it feels warm, but a lot of the time it's just cold all year round almost all year round and I was just used to living in a t-shirt and maybe a sweater so uh, even though I'm pretty flimsy I tend to run hot and if it get if the weather gets too hot I get overheated very very easily and it's uh, I guess I'm just not built for that intense heat anyway when I was scrolling through my stuff I started having these eerie eerie vibes and feelings and of course I tracked it back there was the moon in Pisces for the last few days and it was conjoining Neptune last night in Pisces in such a way that it affects me on a very personal level and I'm just going to share a story with you I'm going to make it anonymous so I don't you know stir up any trouble or anything but my dear friend said, oh, oh, my sister uh, works at the at a really uh, busy store and her best buddy, she called him the uh, work husband, uh, just died. Apparently he killed himself. And so I, I took the whole news neutrally and then I was invited to like offer any feedback in case I got any sensations about it. So, a, a day later, I did. And I was coming back from the atrium, which is where I was yesterday, where they have all these indoor trees, and like a, the ceiling is about, I don't know, 25 stories high. And then the atrium is built inside, it's built inside the, uh, underneath the, the skylight and it's surrounded by hotel rooms it, it's actually uh, to me it's really beautiful in its own quirky way and uh, down below you have all the these waterfalls and artificial presence uh, just artificial nature environments and for me it was very soothing because there was a very loud waterfall sound and everything so I was very very relaxed and I was watching uh, the beautiful little animal shorts videos and it really warms your heart. And then I decided it was time to leave. I was also just doing a lot of daydreaming, literally just a lot of daydreaming. And I had to do a couple of chores while I was there, um, changing banknotes and things. Anyway, on the drive back uh, to the house, I felt a sudden presence. And it was a male presence. And it was a fellow. I, you know what? Let me go over here. And now there I am driving away, and I felt this male presence, somebody giving me this really tight hug. 
almost like you know in an emergency when like if you've had friends or family that have been through something very serious and then they see you they don't even talk or anything they just they just grab onto you and hold you like that like for life anyway I had that feeling and I realized very quickly oh this is the fellow who um, uh, passed away and I, I was driving along having this experience so it, it's very much just like being in a car with a real person sitting next to you sharing an experience so the only this one was from beyond the veil so to speak and the feeling that I got and it, it felt fully genuine to me and authentic I realized okay this is the fellow and I could see visually that it was a fairly average maybe tall sized guy probably white and his hair was sort of like this dark hair pulled back and I thought god it looks like um, like a like a helmet or something I didn't understand the hair at all and he looked like a sort of a weathered gnarly fellow and he was just uttering a few key words like like oh my god I don't know what I was thinking oh dear what have I done I can't, I can't undo this and I felt a lot of grief and I felt a lot of confusion and I just said I spoke out loud I was saying well hey man thanks for sharing with me I think I know who you are and thanks for reaching out um, I'm a friend of these people and so maybe that's why you connected with me because after I was requested to connect I basically went to my invisible friends and said to them like hey if this fellow wants to connect could you act as a facilitator I'll just carry on with my life so that's what happened and so later on I got back to the house and I shared the story about the connection with my dear friend and that kind of corroborated everything and it made lots of sense and I just emphasized the three feelings that I got was like from the fellow it was like damn what was I thinking it's just like I I, I did my few I, I just flipped I, I just I had to get out I had to get out and the only way I could describe it is just like take you if you're going to an event or a situation or a gathering of some kind maybe a public gathering or you know a social place or friends or family or a party or an event or something and suddenly you look around like, oh man, I, I, I don't want to be here. I'm sorry, I got to go, I got to go, I got to go. And you just go. There's not a lot of, whatever, whatever the impulses were, the reasons were not elaborated to me. It was just like, I got to go. I, I can't be here anymore. And then when he crossed over to the other side, he realized, oh my God, I, I acted on impulse. What? I didn't even it's not like I even hardly planned it at the conscious level obviously it must have been there at the subconscious level for him and eventually it manifested as like oh I gotta go anyway I shared that story with my friend and I'm hoping she corroborates but I shared that anyway and all of this happened at the same time that Neptune was conjoined with the moon in Pisces and of course we already have Saturn in Pisces there and so these are what I call very 12th house issues, all to do with universal love, anything beyond the veil, and so on. And I realized it was building up for days, because the moon was there for a couple of days already. The moon is already in Aries now, but I'm, let's say, absorbing the energy and understanding it and putting it out uh, in a way uh, that's succinct and forceful, because I need to get it out there and share it, okay? The next thing I want to share with you is that night, like yesterday, I had lots of strange dreams. And I couldn't remember any of them. I just shared with my dear friend, like, man, I had some really strange dreams last night. I don't know what they were, but they're very strange. And today, I just recognized what one of them was. One of them was a dream where perhaps I was reliving one of my own traumatic offense effects uh, events in water because I've had quite a few uh, very 
very deadly situations in water, oceans, uh, where I basically take in a lot of water and I'm left for dead. But in each case, well, in one case I was not rescued. I was just being observed from the shoreline and people were just watching me. Anyway, I was being tossed in these huge roller waves. I was stupid to go in the water. And I, I was doing body surfing, but it was way too much for me. I just didn't know it. I just was supremely optimistic and thought, oh, I can do this. <laughs> I was totaled. And the other incident, well, a couple of others, but anyway. So I have my own traumatic events with water and being trapped under massive, massive breakers. And I realized in this dream, wow, I am trapped in these enormous, enormous 25, 25, 30 foot breakers. And I'm being tossed around like a bubble. Up or down kind of didn't mean anything, but I could see very, very crystal clear uh, that I was very much alive and being tossed around, but I also realized that I'm, I'm going to die. And in the dream, I did die because I started taking in water and I couldn't hold my breath anymore, so I just sucked in a lot of salt water. And that was pretty much the end of the dream. And everything kind of went dark. Today, right now, not more, not more than an hour ago, I was in the library doing some more um, things to cheer myself up, and I stumbled on one of these end-of-life uh, phenomenon videos and near-death experience videos. And I just clicked on one of them, and this guy started talking, oh man, well, yeah, I used to do deep-sea diving and ocean rescues and geological ocean geology stuff. For cruise. I did that for 20 years, so, you know, I spent half my life underwater, blah, blah, blah. And then he described, one day we were called in to help on a search and rescue, and we couldn't get into the shore from our ship, so we decided to take one of those inflatable Zodiac boats uh, towards the shore, knowing that we're going to head into these 30-foot breakers. So, these guys are tough. They're used to it. They're in their 20s and 30s. So they go in, but one of them was, was <laughs> totally pummels the Zodiac, and they all go under. And then this guy telling the story realizes he's been separated from all his buddies, the other buddies on the Zodiac. And he's trapped, and he's looking around. He realizes, oh my God, I'm trapped in 30-foot breakers, just tumbling, 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 over and over and over again. And then he realized, I can't hold my breath anymore. Oh my God. <sighs> and then he sucks in all this seawater and he dies. Weird, huh? So anyway, after he dies, he goes across to the other side and he tells these classic stories about meeting some of his invisible friends and family and pets and things and experiencing love, the essence of love. And eventually, he sees lots of things about his future life and past life, and that goes pretty quickly. It's in great detail, but eventually, a spirit energy comes up to him and says, no, 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 you cannot go any further. You have to go back. You have responsibilities and purpose and chores, okay? So you've got to take care of it. You're here for a reason. You're going to be around for quite a while, so... Get going. Get out of here. And the guy said, I don't want to go back. It's, it's much better here than back there. I, 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 I was drowning. You have to go back. Anyway, so the guy went back and there he was. <coughs> and he realized he was being pulled to the top of the ocean on a rope that was connected to his arms. And he realized, oh, the rope is attached to the Zodiac, and the Zodiac was bouncing on top of the breakers. So he bounced up on top of the breakers as well and started spewing out salt water and started breathing again. So he was actually only dead for probably like 30 seconds or maybe a minute. That's about as much as you can go underwater with, uh, you know, before you actually die without coming back. So anyway, he came back 
and eventually he got all connected up with his buddies on the Zodiac and they all were kicking their feet heading towards shore and they made it to shore and everything was great. I just thought it was very weird. It felt to me like I just had a dream where I was living the exact experience of this guy on YouTube. Only I had the experience 36 hours beforehand. All right, here's another weird thing. I just started watching a, a wacky uh, episodic thing on Netflix called Katla. It's about an Icelandic volcano that goes crazy and it creates these bizarre things where people are moving around between different time zones, you know, 20 years in the future, 20 years in the past, and it's set in, the story is told in such a way that it looks extremely ordinary. All the people are very, very routine, ordinary in this desolate little village where they do science research on the volcano. And then all these weird things start happening where people are coming and going outside of the time frames that we talk about. Anyway, so I'm just giving you a couple of examples, but this has been going on for me for a long time in my life, and I'm just realizing the accuracy and the precision of it all to the point where I wanted to share these stories today. So I want to go on to a few more things, and this is much more on the global scale of the world. So let me go over here, see if I can share. Um, okay, so I was watching a really good comprehensive uh, news report. And the theme was like, what are the important highlights right now, especially regarding uh, the global situation, global politics and economics. And today the subject was the oceans, because 80% of world trade occurs across and through the oceans, from one port to another. The big traffic routes, of course, are from China to America, you know, basically Shanghai to Long Beach. The other big traffic routes are from China through here, China here, China there, China over here. And then the other big trade routes are to do with, there's lots, for example, Japan imports, what, 95% of its food because they don't, they can't grow enough over there. So there's a lot of, tremendous amount of shipping that goes on through here. So these waters are heavily contested now because you know who, these folks over here, they want it all. All right because they're desperate. And over here, this is a very, very important shipping route right here. All these shipping routes through here are very, very important for global trade. Then you get right into here, into the Middle East, okay? You've got uh, the Straits of Hormuz, because a lot of oil comes from here, comes out there, around the Horn, and up through here, and through the, Panama, uh, the Suez Canal, and up into Europe, and Rotterdam over here. So these are very, very, very important trade routes, especially for oil and gas, okay? Food and everything else, but especially oil and gas. Uh, there's other important trade routes up here, very much to do with Ukraine. I don't know, this map isn't showing up very well. Okay, maybe let's do it over here. And that doesn't show it very well either. Okay, the, the Black Sea over here, the Bosphorus over here. This is a very important sea route over here. Also up in the Baltics up here, very important sea routes up around uh, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia. Other important sea routes, Eastern Russia out here to get Russian stuff out. And uh, North uh, South Korea. And of course, all of the Southeast Asia and India. Tons of stuff comes in and out of India. The, the other really, really important routes are around all, of course, here and here, shipping, but the Panama Canal, okay? So you're probably going to guess already. What's the common link between all these incredibly important shipping routes? Well, I'll tell you. For the last, what, 40 years or so, maybe 60 years ago, they've been heavily guarded and maintained 
uh, by the United States Navy, which of course includes helicopters and jets and armies and all of that stuff, but the Navy especially. So here, 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 especially, and here, and up here, and up here, okay? <sighs> not a lot goes down here because these waters are very dangerous down here. And not so much goes down here except for local trade here because most of the trade goes through here. Supplies and demands and all of that. So anyway, these folks were talking about all this stuff with uh, global trade. They talked about the Straits of Hormuz, the Suez Canal, the Panama Canal, Rotterdam ports, the South China Seas, the Indian Ocean, the Bosphorus, the Black Sea, and of course America, Los Angeles, uh, you know, what's it called? Long Beach and the other ports up here, ports over here. But here's what's happening. I'm going to flip around here. Back in the 1980s, uh, the U.S. Navy had about 800 warships of various kinds, huge aircraft carriers, support ships, and all of that, massive air force. Today, we're down to 300 operational ships. That is just a staggering dereliction of duty, as far as I'm concerned, because the problems are much worse now than they ever were. A lot of the emphasis, of course, was on the Middle East to maintain the oil flows out of the Middle East towards the Western markets here and here and here and here. Anyway, I'm going to try it. I don't know how to describe this, but it's, it's almost creepy when you discover and you realize that this is the same 40-year time period that was occupied mostly by uh, Clintons, Bushes, Obamas, and now Bidens. We'll forget the other fellow, Donald, because he was a complete anomaly. But those were very long terms, and they add up to almost the same time frame. So you know what happened, of course, in that time frame. This place expanded dramatically in its economy and trade with the world. It's a kleptocracy. In other words, they, uh, they rule through theft. It's a totalitarian, uh, extremely thuggish dictatorship. And it's run as a Marxist uh, organization, crime organization. And there is a very, very disturbing marriage between this place and this place. I've talked about it many, many times. They're basically interlocked in a very sick marriage. They can't function without each other. This is a massive debt farm which produces currency that goes over here uh, to be dispensed in a massive slave camp to make a bunch of stuff that gets shipped and sold over here. This place can't function without America or Western Europe. This place can barely function, this place can barely function without this place here. So it's a very sick marriage because a lot of it depends on the abuse of the masses, the abuse by the leadership to the masses. So it's now coming into full, full awareness that the people here, especially, and some here, have been duped into such extravagance and comfort and luxury of enjoying lots and lots of cheap stuff for the last 40 years, <laughs> while a lot of, let's say, technology is being shoved over here. Today, a massive report came out about Cisco Tech, C-I-S-C-O. They've been working for years, very, very secretly, but now it's fully open, They've been working for years to help build the CCP technology to do all the surveillance and control matters that they put onto the slave camps and the, the Uyghurs and the Falun Gong people. So in other words, Americans are 100% complicit in enabling the CCP to be the monster that it is. And the reason that's happening is because those administrations that I'd mentioned those four big ones that I mentioned, uh, they make money for themselves by selling out our country to them for the mutual advantage 
of the corporation. So in other words, look at it this way. Corporate America, Wall Street, the banks, and the United States and federal government, they are all deep, deep in bed with the CCP. Okay? They make personal profits through the CCP slave camps and so on. Then what happens with the personal profits? Guess what happens? Corporate America, all these folks up here, they reinvest those profits to keep the relationship going. Okay? In other words, they're, we're build, they're building the end of the USA as we know it. In other words, they are funding these guys to eat us alive. Okay? So the people... They're working together, actually. Well, they're not together. They're like competitors. There's these folks. You recognize those initials, WEF. You know these ones, CCP. They basically have infiltrated our beautiful place to the point we are where we are highly diseased, extremely, extremely, extremely sick as a country, as a population, as an economy, as a culture. And it's becoming very, very obvious this beautiful thing here is very, very sick. Okay? So who do we watch out for? Obviously, these folks and these folks. These are enemy number one. So the thing is, why am I talking about all this? Because when I was watching all of this, I was thinking, I, I know, I've known this since I was a kid. Why Why is it taking so long for the rest of the world to wake up? I never really talked about it openly because I just assumed everybody knows. And I just carried on with my own personal life. I was completely self-absorbed, wanting to do music and pop music and art and be a private entrepreneur. And it was just failure after failure after failure after failure. But I kept going anyway. There is some kind of purpose and meaning for me to be here. And so... Uh, I, I'm not really allowed to take myself out. I got to keep going, for whatever reasons. Maybe to help people or something. Anyway, let's take it a step further. When you understand that this place here and the bosses, the CCP, they want everything. All right, please understand that they want everything. You know, talk about Belt and Road Initiative. They want everything because they got 1.4 billion people here they can't really feed them all properly and their economy is completely imploding right now and frankly china needs us a lot more than we need them but they are reaching out and they they have to save face so they're putting on this extremely aggressive front like we're gonna we're gonna wipe you out if you don't do what we say but in fact this place is very fragile very brittle, and it's going to be even worse over the next two years. I guarantee it. You just have to look at the astrology. Of course, we're having our own astrological meltdown over here, but it's a completely different storyline, and I've shared that many times. Anyway, let's get back to basics. One of the core themes about the reports that I was watching today was water. Seawater, okay, but also fresh water. Seawater is where all the trade goes, where we have our oceans and our navies, and where there's a lot of global urr, urr, to try and find a balance of power to keep everything moving in global trade. And so these folks here obviously are trying to disrupt it because they want all of it. They want everything. They want everything that you have, that we have. They want all, all our timber, our water, our food. Uh, our animals, our pork, beef, chicken. Uh, they want all the mineral resources here. They want everything, okay? So that's what they're doing. They have a massive ambitious plan, but it's all, of course, funded by astronomical printing of money in the form of debt. You've probably heard about it, the Belt and Road Initiative, and it's just, uh, they're very good at it because they flood fake money into these places that can't really understand what's going on. Uh, the corrupt leaders of places take the money, uh, stash a bunch of it in their pockets, and then just turn away while China takes over the, the locals. It's very disturbing, but it works. It's a business model, and it works, and it's now becoming worldwide knowledge, okay? But anyway, let's go a little bit deeper. Think about fresh water.
We have abundant fresh water here, but it's mostly on this side of the country. Okay, it's all over here. Over here, this is desert. We're getting more and more desertification over here. This is getting drier and hotter. This is getting warmer and wetter, and so on and so on. We all know that. It's probably to do with sun cycles, bits up and down, up and down, up and down. Anyway. I can't talk too much more, but I had to get this out of me. Uh, we're going to do a show tonight. Hopefully I can get to those readings. Anyway, if we figured out how to do it, we could get fresh water everywhere. Okay? If they can ship oil and gas all over the country through pipelines, like they have all over here, they can do water all over here, from here, 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 here so on. Anyway, that's not really where I'm going here. The last little bit that I wanted to share on that story about water is about Tibet. Okay, why Tibet? Okay, it's a very small place, but it's completely controlled by the CCP over here. And why is it so important? It's because of all the water you know, in America, we have the Rockies and the Colorado snowfalls up here that provide water to the west. And it's the same thing over here. They've got the Himalayas, and it provides billions and trillions of gallons of water to China and India and all these countries here, Pakistan, the, all the Ishtans, uh, Southeast Asia, and so on. And so guess what? These folks here, are doing every. They've already built hundreds and hundreds of dams and uh, conversions and uh, mutilations of the natural river flows uh, to get it to work for them. Of course, mess with nature too much and you create uh, secondary disasters. So right now, uh, I just made a note here because I think it's very important. The Tibetan plateau is under complete CCP control. They don't want, the, the, the Tibetans don't want that. The Indians don't want that. But anyway, it is. The point is they're trying to capture fresh water for billions. All of this is happening during the time where Saturn is in Pisces, Neptune is in Pisces, and we just had the moon in Pisces for a few days. Water. The beauty and wonder of water and the tragic side of water. Do you see where I'm going here with the storyline? Now, as a sort of a secondary thing that came as a result, here's some, let's say everything we were talking about, about global trade and the enforcement of the, uh, you know, maritime rights and everything to keep global stability with the economics and so on, and trade, global trade, uh, the America has dominated for the last 60 years or so, but its dominance has gone down and down and down as, uh, as we have been derelict with our military. And so CCP sees an option. Well, if they're becoming so derelict, we can move in and take over. And of course, that's part of the plan. That's what Uncle Joe and his admin are trying to do. They're trying to scuttle this place to the point where it's so dysfunctional here that it just basically opens the floodgate to these folks here. And by the time we figured out how to really stop it, it's too late and they've already got control. So that's going to play out over the next 20 years or so with Pluto and Aquarius, guaranteed. In the meantime, uh, China is going to have issues with water itself because Saturn is moving through Pisces for the next two years. And that's a very significant aspect for China. It's however bad things are in here right now, it's going to get a lot worse, especially when it comes to uh, money and their natural resources. Okay, so just watch out. And the worse it gets over there, the more belligerent they're going to get out here and more dangerous they are because they have people everywhere on Earth. consequences. What happens if we fail and all of this folks here and the WEF over here start to take over? In other words, we end up with a globalized Marxist totalitarian surveillance state and we have no control because we acquiesce. We just buckled under. So in terms of buckling under, failure, losses, buckling under, 
and natural death, the story goes to the Netherlands. Okay, right now their whole country is right on their whole country is based on Rotterdam and all the shipping and agriculture that goes on here. It's a very intense agricultural area and shipping. Incredibly important part of the world economy right here. Anyway, you remember all those farmers who were vaulting and trying to take back their country uh, from the WEF? It's not working. The WEF is winning. And the, the, the Tri-City thing that, they're, that the WEF is trying to build over here is starting to work because there, are, there is so much immigration from open borders that's coming over here. And the whole idea is to dissolve the boundaries, dissolve the power and money control from the old status quo and turn it into a completely dependent, crippled uh, welfare environment controlled by the United Nations, the World Economic Forum, the World Health Organization, and so on, in collusion with the CCP. That's their plan. And it's starting to work. If you've seen what's happening in France, again, you'll understand. It's a complete, complete implosion. And it's spreading like a disease. And uh, the Prime Minister over there, whatever his name is, Macron, he can't stop it. So it's spreading. France is basically falling apart. Netherlands is falling apart. England is kind of falling apart as well. Finland, Norway, and Sweden are holding strong. Hungary, Italy, holding strong. But it's a very, very tough fight. What's happening is the information wars, in other words, media, is convincing the locals that everything's going to be great when they have the Tri-City thing going on, 15-minute cities, and the farms have been destroyed. Basically what those folks are trying to do, who are trying to control everything, and they want to wipe out billions of people and claim all the resources for themselves and re reorganize the whole of planet Earth. Um, okay, now here this is just one last little perspective thing before I disappear. Actually, I got two more. So regarding the French riots, you know, it was all, um, let's say, set alight by that young little fellow who was killed by a French cop, okay? The young boy who was killed was a migrant, and there are millions of migrants in France, and they have a very, they're, it's, they live in poor conditions, and they are very hostile towards France. All those migrants come from North Africa here. So what I don't understand is if they hate France so much, why are they going there? It must be even worse back where they are. That's the only thing I can think of. Anyway, the riots have been simmering for decades, and they exploded recently. Now, this is where it's going to. This is where you're going to get these weird reality checks. There's a crowdfunding site set up for the young boy, and they've already reached 450,000 euros just in a matter of days. And guess what happened? The cop, the French cop who shot the little boy, they have a crowdfund too, and they're already up to 1.2 million. So what does that tell you? I'll leave you to draw your own conclusions. Think of it as an information war. The Macron media, he's hardcore Marxist, CCP, WEF, lefty. They're trying to impose their agenda. On the other side are just ordinary people. Their version of the info, info war is that they're more like traditional patriots, friends, family, and, you know, freedom type of thing. And all this political garbage is meaningless to them. And if you look at just the dollars, because dollars speak very loudly, well, euros, this voice is almost, is, is more than double this voice. So it wouldn't surprise me if the riots in France start to move towards a more of a nationalist type of agenda soon. Lastly, I guess in some ways this is one of the most important things. This also happened during the moon in Pisces conjoining Neptune and Pisces. 
at the very final last degrees. I stumbled on this uh, video channel uh, called um, Hospice Nurse Julie and she was recounting some stories about end-of-life phenomenon because that's what her channel's about. And she touched on all these things. Remember I started this little video and we were talking about these uh, we were talking about that fellow. Uh, let me get back over here. Sorry. We were talking about that fellow who drowned and then came back. And I shared with you my own experience from uh, like 36 hours earlier, where I had basically a replica dream of his situation. It's like I had lived through his situation. It's very, very weird. Anyway. So I was pondering all of this today, like, why are all these like mystical things happening in such a way that, you know, I take all this for granted. I have my invisible friends and I talk to them. They talk to me. I have this particular thing at nighttime. It's very common for me to be laying down and then things kind of light up and I can see people on the other side. They're typically up in the corners. So a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right. And mostly the women on my left and the guys on my right. And they know me very well. And I, apparently I know them quite well on the other side. But here I can't quite identify them. Anyway, they are very much a part of my life. And it's very normal for me to be laying down and I start to vision these things. And then I start to reach up and I can feel my hands making contact with them. It's just like, hey man, good to see you. Like, eh, good to see you, man. So I'm in touch with them, and they're in touch with me, and we share stories and stuff like that. Sometimes I'll go for a week without any connection, but they're there all the time anyway. Anyway, Nurse Julie, she was talking about, like, a list of things, what happens. Okay, so pretend I'm used to Nurse Julie. She was talking about, well, here I am at my uh, hospice center, and there's people who are coming in. They're in hospice for a reason, because they're going to die soon. That's it, in kind of a, a controlled environment. And whether it's from liver disease and alcoholism or from old age or trauma or whatever it is, they're going to die. And she said uh, there are some very consistent patterns and events that occur. I can't remember all of them. She listed about five. Uh, some of them were like... Uh, I'll just go into the vision. She said one of them is particular. They call in in her hospice. They call it visioning. And visioning uh, can often come. It's not when you're getting flashes. It's, she said it comes uh, really close to the end, where the patient is typically in bed or a recliner or something like that, and they start to see things and they're starting to go, oh, oh, hi, hi. And if the patient is strong enough, they typically reach up and they try to make hand-to-hand -hand contact. Okay? And I started thinking, well, that's, I do that all the time with my invisible friends. But I'm not dead and I'm not dying. <laughs> anyway, the nurse was very sweet about it. She said, I don't really know what's going on. I'm just recounting what I observe here. We call it, we call it visioning. And these are some of the... Uh, very recognizable steps that occur at different stages the closer they get to uh, death. And the visioning thing, she said, it's always sweet, it's always good, and it's very, very comforting for the patient. And uh, it's very common for the patient to speak out loud, even when the nurses are in the room during hospice. And they'll talk with like, oh, hi, mom. Oh, how? Oh, it's, it's, uh, oh, look, it's Fluffy, Fluffy the Poodle. Oh, hi. It's, oh, you look so sweet. How are you doing? There's this exchange, and very shortly after, and there's, it's very common to reach up. Oh, they're, oh, they're in the corner. The nurse was describing how the, the characters on the other side are typically up in the corner of a room, uh, typically out of arm's reach, but certainly visible during the vision thing. So I thought that was very cool. I just wanted to share that part of the story. Anyway, I want to get going now because uh, 
I have to save my voice for this evening in case we do these readings. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you got something out of this. I'm doing this because I had to share, because uh, it all felt very significant to me. Well, like, why is all this ethereal Piscean stuff happening to me right now? And why do I have to convey this? And I'm actually talking about it in terms of very three-dimensional experiences, like all that China stuff I was talking about. That's just natural flow to me. And all I'm, th all I'm feeling is like, well, I'm finally being validated, you know? Anyway, thank you for listening. Hope you got something out of it. Take care and see you soon. Bye.